Welcome to BIMSTORM Oklahoma City. This is Kimon Onuma. We'll be starting here in a few minutes. We have um, Fineth Jernigan online from um, Oklahoma City. Fineth, you want to say a few words? Yes, hello, welcome, good morning, and welcome to the to the first live session. We have, why don't you describe where you are and what's going on there, and what's the prep work that's going on, so everybody knows okay, what's, so, what the Okay, so what's is. happening right now, okay, so what's happening right now, uh, we're in the, um, in the College of Architecture at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. Um, we've got um, we've got a two two uh, large classes one on one of uh, construction uh, students and one of, of uh, senior architectural students that are all um, all working some they're working with uh, several um, uh, industry sponsors um, from around from around this region. Uh, they're all here in the in the space. I'm in a I'm in a conference room right now. Um, the students are in a couple of different studios as they as they work on their projects. Okay, great. And we actually have an agenda posted uh, that's been updated even the last few hours. If you go to bimstorm.com and you click anywhere in the bimstorm logo in the middle of the page. It'll take you to a list on the left side, or you go to bimstorm.com slash OKC, but it's Oklahoma, basically. The link on the left side takes you to the Oklahoma pages, and along the top, this is the material we've been posting over the last few weeks, but along the top, there's uh, several new buttons. One of them is Agenda, and underneath the agenda, it lists uh, this week's agenda. We started uh, on Monday doing prep work before Fineth flew out to Oklahoma City yesterday. We've been prepping yesterday, and today we're on the Wednesday schedule, um, starting at 10 a.m. Central. Uh, basically, the kickoff, uh, we'll have Tammy and Lee in her class online uh, doing an intro, um, and we'll be starting to show some of the results. We're seeing some results coming in, but the intent today is to kind of do an introduction, and then we'll continue on this afternoon with a live session. We're going to have Balfour Beatty Construction and others online um, showing their work. Um, today's session is more of an interactive live session where we're going to be going through some uh, work, looking at some actual projects and results and helping the teams along. That'll happen. This, uh, there's two sessions today, basically, the session A, which we're in right now, and session B. And then tomorrow there's going to be ongoing uh, sessions in the morning from 10 a.m. Central again for one hour. Uh, and Thursday, I mean Friday the 9th, uh, we're going to be moving the location from the University of Oklahoma to Oklahoma City. Uh, okay, so now... Oops, we have somebody else online. Bringing him some new audio. We jumped in. Oh, okay, went off. And uh, just some logistics here. Whoever is online and wants to say anything, there's a chat box in the GoToMeeting Go to webinar control panel on the right side. If you look at your chat box right now, I'll just put a hi in there to the whole audience. You can see I'm sending you a message, but you can either send a, a message through the uh, chat chat box or, or there's a question and answer um, box as well. But if we use chat, then we'll be able to open up the audio for you to speak. Um, Fineth or Lee, uh, Lee and Tammy, are you guys online or should we just keep on going here? Um, I'm here, Kimon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Tammy. Well, welcome. Hi. Hi. Why don't you describe, um, describe where you are and who you're with so everybody online also knows what's going on. Okay. Well, I am in um, one of the rooms with uh, our industry participants, and uh, they're getting started to kick off. We have uh, Manhattan Construction and JE Dunn here right now. Austin Commercial is on the way. Um, their flight didn't get in until about nine, so they're on their way. Um, but we're just—they're just starting to um, join in, and we'll be in this room uh, for the remainder of the day. Lee uh, probably cannot uh, correspond right now with the microphone because she's in the lab with the uh, 50 or 60 students we have down there right now um, getting logged in and getting started. So um, she's, I'm sure, busy. <laughs> OK. Well, great. Thanks for setting this up. Um, and whenever you guys are ready to say anything, let me know, and we'll 
um, open up the mics for you. Um, so maybe, Finance, should I show a few glimpses of what we're, we're actually just opening up some projects just this morning, even from a few minutes ago, we're seeing some results coming in. Uh, well, come on, why don't you let me have, let me take the screen for a minute. Let me just show yeah. one of the one of what looks to be a pretty good example of some of the things starting that are starting to come together already from the students. Okay. And uh, maybe that'll give a that'll give others some ideas. Okay. Um, if you don't if you okay. don't mind, let me uh, let me see. I don't let's see. see. Do you see it? Hmm. There we go. Got it. Okay. For some reason, we're okay, logging. Okay. So you're seeing thing. my screen. Hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah, we're using the same login. Okay, go ahead. Okay, got it. Okay, so so this is a um, this is a project. Um, I don't know, come on. Do you remember who who the the person who generated this? I think you've looked at this the courtyard project the courtyard as well. Courtyard project. Let me see. Hold on a second. We're just getting the messages in here. So courtyard project uh, came from Amy. Okay, so Amy, um, oh yeah, here it is. It's Amy from Amy Shell, and uh, just wanted to uh, just sort of, this is kind of an interesting looking, um, interesting start. What we're seeing, I guess, is the, uh, is the lower floor of this, but I just, uh, for grins, pulled it out into Google Earth, and um, here's what it looks like, um, you know, all new construction out in Google Earth. Um, when I start looking at the data in it, um, uh, it's uh, she hasn't started looking at parking. She hasn't actually put parking in the system and all. And how many? She's not. I guess not. Bases and those kind of things. But you know, the, the work is starting to uh, generate some usable data. It's a ninety-eight thousand eight hundred thirty-seven square foot building, um, cut on a three-acre site. Um, looks like you know it's generating electric use and water and uh, how much salt solid waste is being generated, all those kind of things. So it's doing all the kind of things that, uh, you know, we, you know, the, the models do right at the beginning after they get into the system. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of an interesting um, view of, um, you know, project near the, near the river, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, four interconnected buildings on a courtyard. Um, I did. I did also, though, and one of the other things I did, and this is probably in some ways the most critical piece of it from our perspective, is uh, Amy started to uh, make, put attachments in, and um, yeah, let's just go and look at some of these. Like here's the design development one. Let's see what we got going on here. So um, this is, um, I guess, this is some of her early analysis work in the studio. Uh, where she's looking at some precedents, so getting the kind of urban design kind of analysis of of other places that have similar things. Um, she's looking at some of the demographics, and I guess she started doing some sketching, hand sketching, which is cool. I mean, it's uh, looking at some of the code requirements. So the, you know, she you know, what's a psychometric charts and uh, you know all kinds of other other things. I guess she's she looks like she's gone out into uh, SketchUp and probably in Revit and looking at adjacencies. Um, one of the cool things uh, would be, come on, maybe, maybe um, why don't you show, when I hand it back to you, why don't you show um, her how to, uh, how she would take these adjacencies and, and add them into the model. Sure, that might cool. be a good, uh, that might be a good uh, place. She's, it looks like she's done the work. It's now just getting them into a way that um, sort of carries through. Right. Uh, Actually, so maybe if you can, yeah, I mean, here she's got some bubble diagrams, but if you know, maybe show her, show them how to how to handle that adjacency issue. Mm -hmm. um, but she's got, you know, it's a lot of lot of development work already loaded up, and which is cool. I mean, that's that's just what we're looking for, I think. Um, Actually, go go see. to the before you leave Amy's project. Go to the report button, find it. Uh huh. There's actually a lot of attachments she's attached. If you go to the attachment button, right. Right? No, go to the yeah. attachment. There's yeah, cost, that's, that's co what... cost estimates and uh, facade color studies. So there's a lot of background material that's been attached here. Like there's a uh, uniform at cost estimate I noticed at the bottom where it says estimate V1. So okay, a... let's look at that real quick. Just for everybody that's online, I, I use... Um... 
I use uh, numbers, max numbers, so uh, we may get some squirrely things happening here. But uh, yeah, so so she's she's got a pretty, I mean, a uniform at breakout. Um, see how on the garage and mm -hmm. and it would be interesting to see how she whether these uh, square footage numbers came out of the uh, out of the Enuma system model or whether uh, how she actually got to these so so Amy if you're listening one of the things we would be looking for is where exactly did all these numbers come from hey fine um, yes I'm sorry I, I may be able to interject yeah. there because Amy is one of our architecture students who is working with one of the construction students so her, uh -huh. her team member is Cody Wheeler, and okay. uh, they've been working on this, actually, and that's part of what Cody is um, tasked with doing for, uh, as, as the member on, on, uh, with Amy, is uh -huh. providing feedback and square foot cost, and out of both Onuma and um, the Revit, the desktop. Right. So right. And, looking, and, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's it where would that, be good. Those are coming yeah. from. That's where that's coming from. It's coming out of Revit. Uh huh. Okay. Well, and and it would be interesting then to see uh, because now that they've pushed the model back into the Enuma system, it would be interesting to see you know whether she whether the system is tracking the same numbers if for no other reason than you know is the um, you know is the data coming from the Revit model in a in a repeatable and verifiable way. Exactly. Um, that's one you of the probably. Their yeah, you've probably talked to them about that, but one of the biggest issues with these data and interchanges is making sure that the information is repeatable. Right. And so, and, and so part of, um, just to elaborate a little bit on that, since uh, we're in, in that mode, um, that is part of the task on the mm -hmm. construction side with the cost estimating is, is verifying and comparing and you know, doing a uh, analysis based on the, the different data and the data generation um, and mm -hmm. comparing that. So right. with their, um, with the Revit output, and I don't really, they had different options to run that analysis on the desktop, but that right. may be strictly by object uh, through a symbol to... Um, well, we, right. And and from our perspective, you know, the whole idea here is to use, you know, use the tools you're comfortable with. Use the, you know, use the be ideally use the best tool for the job. Right. Right. The the goal here, I would just just suggest everybody, is that these numbers, how wherever they're coming from and however they're done, since they need to be repeatable, one of the things that we like to try to do is let's make sure everybody knows where the numbers come from, so we have a so we have a uh, authoritary source for whatever numbers are coming out of these systems, and whether it's Revit or, you know, Navis or we don't. In a way, we don't really care where it comes from as long as we clearly know, you know, that it's repeatable throughout the system. So, so that I mean, one of the things Amy and and uh, the, the, her team could do is look at um, maybe maybe just doing a back check. And documenting where her num where the numbers came from and how they how they were developed. So they even if it were no more than adding a line here that said, you know, these came from Revit model version 18.2 um, with this date on it, or or even put a link to the model right there. Right. Okay. So um, one other comment on the uniformat before you leave it. Actually, why don't you show the uniformat okay. cost? That's actually interesting. Somebody actually went through and. Uh, did a more detailed Thanks. unit cost analysis on the building. And assuming that this came from Revit, for example, then, then there was another program probably used to do a detailed cost estimate. Well, we're, and we'll actually show that this afternoon, I think, when Deep Profiler jumps online, too. The, the Beck team, uh, they use Uniformat as well. The, this level of detail, what we're interested in here is almost like the bottom line, like what's the total cost and how is it being generated? Um, when we attach it back into the model server in Onuma, we, we can bring all these numbers in, but we don't track individual elements. So you're almost like using multiple tools to kind of get to a, a create a trajectory of where we're we heading with the cost and what, uh, what are the assumptions were. So even here, it would be interesting to know, was this generated from another software? Or was it done by hand? Was it 
the quantities generated from Revit. So kind of telling the story of what's going on here. One other thing on the square footage that's important to note is as you go through and start using these tools, each tool kind of calculates areas a little bit differently, especially if the spaces aren't classified, for example, attached to an attribute, then you might get them jumping to a different area. So having multiple angles on this allows you to kind of hone in on things that might have been missed or opportunities that might have been missed or even errors in the, 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 the tools that are being used. Uh, so it's kind of a natural right. process of the BIM storm that we actually encourage. Okay, let's do a comparison, not necessarily to say one is right or wrong, but just to say, okay, wh what are the differences? What are we seeing and what, what can we adjust? So this is great. Right, that, and, um, and yeah. Go ahead. Right, and one of the, just to elaborate on that a little bit, the one of the good parts is, is when you do that, and particularly when it goes over into the model server, now you can have a discussion with an owner or with your team and say, oh, wow, we, we've looked at this now and we need to add these, these spaces need to be larger, these spaces need to be smaller, we need to do this or that, and you can get really fast feedback against these numbers, and so now you're, you're starting with these numbers, whether they're square footages or they're co gross cost or whatever they are, and you have the ability to model what ifs very, very quickly once these numbers are pushed back. Right. And that's the that you know the bottom line on this is is to try to get to that um, thing that people have try, been working for, for with BIM for a very long time, where you can look at what ifs in a in almost in real time. Right. One and example. It's, all, it's always good to get to the you know to the bottom line real you know biddable number, but you know we all know that things change all the time, and that's that's what we're trying to to uh, expedite. Right. So, for example, in the uniformant costing, if we notice a very high cost for, well, let's see, what's the foundation or the structural system here? Kind of scroll up. Let's see where we are. Okay. Foundation. Okay, so foundation cost is 11% special basement walls. So if you say, okay, 11% of the total cost in broad terms is relating to foundations and possibly under, you know, basement excavation, for example. If a building had a, a pretty complex site and you're going underground a couple floors, obviously that's going to push the cost up. So you can go back to the planning model and say, okay, what happens if we lift it up one floor or if, or if we reduce the amount of excavation that's required by taking the program and bringing it up to the upper floors? Is that going to work? It might work from a cost estimating point of view. It might not work from a zoning and a massing and a maximum envelope kind of planning point of view. So having these very extreme angles of a detailed uniform at cost estimating running alongside at the same time as somebody else is analyzing it from a planning perspective, for example. Those are the type of things that we run into quite a bit on previous BIM storms. And this could be an example of that if we can see the logic behind how these numbers were generated. All right, this okay. is great. It's good so. to see this level of detail, actually. And um, maybe uh, there's a lot, actually... And uh, since uh, Amy has shared this, I believe, with everybody that's participating, you can actually click into this project and actually see some of the detail. There's a lot. We're not going to go through every single page here. There's a lot of PDFs and PowerPoints even linked from the bottom there, including MEP system proposals in Word doc format. And so it looks like some pretty good stuff. And a schedule looks like a construction schedule of some sort. Um, so what we... Yeah, it would... Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, let's let's just show a couple of those here. So so there is some some thought process going into um, MEP systems. Um, um, but one of the one of the things that we would uh, you know when you start looking at schedule, one of the things and and again I guess Amy when you're as you're going through that, uh, let's see I'm not gonna I'm not gonna open this. Um, uh, MS project file or Primavera file, which is whatever MPP is. But one of the things that would be good, um, so come on, why don't you show, why don't I give it back to you, why don't you show them a little bit on how to connect um, adjacencies and then also show, um, show how they can uh, connect their time, time schedule in here mm -hmm. and so that they can start actually doing a very quick uh, 4D of this, so that so that when when the presentation actually comes about, that um, she has the ability to um, to come in and actually um, you know sh show this thing actually building in Google Earth. 
Right. Because I, you know, I did. Let's see here. Here it. I mean, here it is in Google Earth. But if it had some times attached to it, we would have the time bar, and we'd be able to see this thing coming out of the ground, right? Right. So I've. I think I've given it back to you. Okay. Hold on a second. Um. You have it. Yeah. But why don't you? Why don't you? If you if you can just show that to those two pieces. Okay. And um. So we'll that'll give that'll give them some more things to work on. Right. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for Amy's project here. I'm just going to do a search of her name. Hopefully, there's only one. Yeah, there's one Amy in the class. It looks like so we have Amy Shell. Um, this project is shared with me as read only, so I can't edit her original work, which is important. I don't want to mess up your scheme, but I'm going to make a duplicate of it and do some other analysis with it. So I'm going to just go ahead and duplicate it and put it into my training session here, and and I'll call this one the analysis. I came on. And I'm going to actually copy everything. It's, it's What it's doing is even the attachments that you created, I can actually bring them over to my side and, and use them on my side too as a, as a duplicate. And it's going to duplicate your building. So it's basically copying everything over into my scheme. So that this is an important step because if I start editing things or whatever, it's not going to adjust your scheme, Amy's scheme, but it's going to allow me to show you some other things or maybe come up with a complete new design proposals. I might say, well, from a, I saw your uniformat cost estimate, and I think if you adjust this part of the building, it's going to help do whatever. And this, this part, the discussion about cost and engineering the building, it obviously has to have other people involved that have that angle or that expertise to be able to even give you that type of input. So I'm on, um, I'm going to go to your second floor. For some reason, this first floor, I can't quite understand. It must be lifted above ground or something. So the first floor, it looks like there's very minimal structure touching the the ground, so it must be an elevated building. Um, I'm guessing this. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to turn off the site context. It's kind of interesting because I, I guess this was imported from Revit, and I think a lot of the results we're seeing right now looks like they started in Revit and actually imported the Nonuma, which is a, it's an, it's a good process, but it would have been nice to see, well, what was the original programming intent starting from an Excel spreadsheet, whether you use the Onuma system, whether you use an Excel spreadsheet or other tools to see what was the original design intent of this pro project. If I turn this to bubble diagrams, we'll actually start to see things like that. Um, so from bubble diagram perspective, I'm just abstracting this now to, okay, there's a, a series of spaces. They're all called rooms, so I don't really know what the function of that room is. And that's one thing that I, we would recommend is actually if this is is it residential? Is it commercial? Is we're on the second floor? If I click on this, it's just the name of it is room, and the number is 32. Um, so one thing I would recommend is actually starting to classify these spaces in some way. Um, I don't know if Amy's online; she probably can't respond. But if you are online, you would like to have a dialogue here. Otherwise, I'm just going to randomly start assigning room names here. Let's call this a. Uh, it could be a, a living room, for example or it might be a, a office space. I have no idea because it's not written in here, so let's just assume here. Now, one interesting here, thing here is that we also have the ability to, before you go into the detailed uniform and cost estimating, there's a way to actually start assigning, is this a, a high, low, or medium cost item? So if you're designing a hospital, for example, an operating room would be high, and a, uh, uh, a waiting room might be low, for example, and this you can start assigning numbers to it, which starts generating the cost estimating at that level of detail before you get into accounting individual elements. Let's just leave this blank for now. Um, so I've changed this one room to a living room, um, and I'm not messing up your original scheme, so don't worry about that. We're just using this as an example. Um, if I if I jump into this room now, let's go inside this living room. Room 36 and 33 look like they're near 32. Um, so I'm going to assume that something's going on, that there's a relationship uh, that needs to be between these rooms. On the right side, there's the um, uh, space relationship bar here. And if I scroll down, I'm in, in room 32. And if I want it to be near room 33, I can actually start. These, this is how you start ge generating those adjacency bubbles that you saw earlier. So you start creating those links, which is part of the database, which starts ending up in reports and all kinds of things. That's why it's important to somehow think of this in terms of data uh, alongside uh, the, uh, the geometry that's being generated there. Um, so if I go back, let's see. Hmm. For 
some reason my my screen has let's go back to the floor plan so if I go back to the floor plan now you will actually be able to see those adjacency lines um, generated from um, I'm going away from the space level and if I turn on the space relationships now on the right side over here um, those adjacency lines start appearing um, in the, uh, the the room right there actually for some reason I picked the wrong one I picked 30 something instead of 36 so you see the 32 and 33 uh, adjacency there um, and come on turn it back into bubbles so it'll be right so if we go a bubble view more traditional yeah bubble diagram bubble. view and if I turn off the floor slab there we go okay um, so there's the adjacency. I picked the wrong room number, so it's at 34. But for example, if 34 really needed to be near 32, then at the bubble diagram level, I can start doing this. All right, so I've just changed the design elements. Maybe this is supposed to go over here. So you can really start using these bubbles to start generating what's the relationship of these spaces. Yeah. The other thing that's missing, I think, in all this... Right, which is just, you know, that's kind of what we've done for, for generations, kind of on paper, but it, it now is embedded in the model. Exactly, yeah. And it's embedded in reports. It's, it's it's tracking. So imagine that this is the client requirement model. The client says, "I want room 34. Need to needs to be room, near room 32." Um, then we can start generating these bubbles. The other thing that we've seen we've only we've seen three or four schemes coming in so far, and I think in all of them it's kind of been the same situation where we're not seeing attributes attached to spaces. So the naming and numbering of rooms is important because then we we know what the function of the room. The other thing that you can do is you can also open it up individual spaces like this and say give them an attribute uh, for example by department is this a common space these are the generic uh, attributes they haven't been defined I'll show you how to define them next but if you start doing this then you start have the ability to color code and and make those part of the report as well too right and you can select mul say if you've got um, 20 technical spaces you can select multiples and do them all at once Exactly. Yeah, you can do this and shift select and do that. So it would be good, even even though they weren't originally set up like this, to actually start doing this to classify space because this ends up in the report, it ends up in the cost estimates, it ends up in a lot of things. Um, Let you start analyzing things like, okay, what's my percentage of classify of technical spaces, or what's my what's my percentage of uh, living unit of housing units compared to um, retail exactly. things like that exactly yeah um yeah, and come on before you leave this uh, because this floor seems to have very few spaces on it can we just check the um the settings related to call the estimate uh to the square footage estimate calculation okay so if we just go to make sure that that amy's got that turned on the right because yeah. she could be getting some really funny numbers in her uh, system level estimating here yeah so if i go to so report we just go back and report let's go to the building report and just look at that first and see what's going on. Because there's not many spaces. There's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, un undefined space in this project. Right. So we're in this. For some reason, there's even okay. two two building. Oh no, there's there's two classifications. So it's one building. We're showing 98,000 square foot net, which are all the spaces, and 98,000 square foot gross. Well, it looks like she may have it set right. You know, she if she's it looks like she, they set it by slab. Right, but that's why I was saying once you go to it and just just show everybody what we're talking about, right? So, rather than do the report, go to go to the settings and well, show yeah. everybody the. Let's look at this first. This second floor we were just on, we classified this space department six. Now it's starting to show us uh, a cross section of the building. So at street level, remember we're at street level, we didn't see very much going on. It looks like this building, if that's the way it's designed, it's designed that the second floor has and the first floor, the street level floor is pretty much empty with just minor elements touching and then there's all some kind of a garden level so I don't know if this was the intent or not but this shows you a level by level and once you start classifying space and you start generating these kind of automatic reports like this right and if and if if there were if the space were classified by departments and use and um, all you know all kinds of different anything that it was uh, classified by you would have an additional pie chart right an additional simple cross-section there's a second pie chart called space utilization. It's not classified, so it's empty. But 
So let's go. You wanted me to go and show the settings of how you actually set these departments up now, right? Well, just yeah, just set no. I'll just show the settings um, in at the um, there you go. Yeah. So uh, then go to the areas. You're in the right area. Okay. General settings. General settings. Custom settings. Actually, or no, our building settings. Mm -hmm. We want to. Well, okay. Show let's, that. Let's first. do. Let's go one step at a time. So one first step departments. Okay. Departments, these were the generic departments set up by the system. So if you're working on a residential unit, um, I would say there's probably things like um, um, retail. Let's just be very rough. Uh, it can be as granular as you want, but I'm just going to call it um, retail, office, residential. Or actually, it might even be, it could either be residential or if you start classifying, well, this is a, li this is a living room, this is a... Uh, bedroom, you can even do that as well too. I'm not going to resolve this here in a few minutes, but I just want to show conceptually um, service area and things like that. So it could either be groupings of things, so you could even say this is a one bedroom unit. It really depends on what you're trying to report. So if you're trying to calculate how many total square feet of one bedroom units do we have versus how much living room do we have, and you can have two different classification systems. I'm kind of mixing up things here, but let's just leave this for now like that and you'll, you'll get the idea. So I'm going to save that. So now what's going to happen is that the color bubbles that we showed earlier, and you could change these too. You could say, oh, I really want living rooms to be orange and, and bedrooms to be uh, purple, etc., cetera, and, and uh, these to be green. And let's just change the colors a little bit so we get some variation here. And you could keep on adding more than 10. You could say add another department. So we're going to save that. Then there's... Yeah, I think right now you can go up to, what, 35, I believe, in the standard... I think we go up to 50. Here, yeah. 35 different departments. Yeah. Then there's also custom settings. You can actually start adding all kinds of other stuff. You could say, well, I want to color code it by floor finish and things like that. But we're so th these are all the additional space attributes. But let's just keep it at um, that for now. Okay. So now if we refresh this screen, actually it's already showing up there. We already showed it. There it is right there. It was actually showing on the um, space attributes. So if we go to department settings now, it'll show up the new attribute settings uh, that we had just set up, and we can start classifying space based on that. Um, so there we go. Departments, there you go right there. And you can also start, I'm just going to be very random here, but we can start looking at that and classifying here by department. Was it residential, for example? Um, okay. So, uh, the cost calculation, if we do this, you'll start seeing it also in the cost calculation. Let's, let's, let's leave that for now. Okay, so that's how you do it one, one at a time. The other way to do this is to actually um, export. So you'd say uh, export an Excel file. Am I going too detailed? I think this is kind of important, so at least I we get some data out of these models. Because the, because these dot models started in Revit, and you could actually do this in Revit as well, too, but if we have this started as a program requirement from an owner, because this is how typically a project starts, an owner says, well, here's a Word document describing the kind of building we want, or here's an Excel file that lists that we want a 100-unit um, condominium. Um, Right, but this also relates to the to the construction students. Um, owners are starting to ask for Kobe at the end of in the construction projects, and and a lot of times it's you know there's not really enough time or energy or money to do this stuff in Revit, you know, on a line by line basis. So this is also a way to inject the the Kobe data into a model. Um, you know, do these kind of classifications very quickly. What you're showing now mm -hmm. is one of the one of the workflows for contractors who are, you know, trying to get that operations and maintenance data pushed over so an owner can use it in their facility management systems. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the Excel file from the building. So, for example, from a Kobe perspective, if the rooms did not have okay, any... come on before you go there, though. Um, just I don't know that anybody's seen this before, so you really need to tell them what the Excel. Okay. Relates to it's more. It's I mean specifically every space within that building. Right? right. So when we hit export, it's taking every space and exporting an Excel file and putting it on your desktop. So on your desktop now, it's created an Excel file with all the spaces, the space name, 
the floor it's on, the number of the space, and a lot of other attributes, the area, the size of the space, um, and a lot of other attributes here. You know, floor finish, if you had all those, these uh, air balance, all that stuff, it's all set at zero right now because there's no data in there. We're just going to focus on one. Right. So, so right. So, one workflow here, where Amy has actually had some input related to MEP systems, would actually be to come back and you can fill in, you know, basically the coding for the MEP system uh, in one of these bar, one of these columns, right? Right. Exactly. And then you would actually, if you injected this back in, you would actually have the MEP coding back into the model. Exactly. Just by injecting it from this perspective. Right, exactly. I'm just color coding this so you can see what I'm going to be editing here next. I'm going to I'm going to be random, but the the coding that we had here, retail, office, residential. This is code is one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I put a one in, it'll change into retail. Two would be office. Three would be residential. So the departmental color coding, and I'll just do this. I'm I'm going to be random because I don't know what these spaces are. But if I knew, for example, these spaces were were retail. Then I could sort the the Excel file by retail, and put the retail number being retail is one, so I can make these both ones, and these would be twos, for example. Um, so I'm just going to take this and just randomly paste this in here, just so you can get a sense of what's going on as far as if you if you uh, put this numbers in, these numbers in, then they're going to start showing up in all the reports. Okay, so we're still on the desktop in Excel here. We haven't edited anything in the actual model. And if I want to start editing, then I, I'm going to go back in and and I could even rename them here if I want to say, just like we did here. If I say this is a one bedroom unit, I could do that as well too, and they'll start showing up in the in the model as well. And you know one thing Oops, lost you. You have number of people and number of parking you spark you hear me come on? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, where you have number of people and parking spaces, this is actually a really good place to actually start looking at, you know, what is the gross occupancy in this project by filling in the the areas that Kimon has highlighted right there, which is the uh, yeah. which is the people occupancies. Right. So if you just put two, if you just copy two all the way down there, come on, we'll suddenly have a building that you know it'll ro it'll roll all that up in the model, right? And so you can see it right out into Google Earth. We can see all this stuff out into Google Earth for that matter. Right. So this is a it's a very rapid way because a lot of people know how to use Excel. You can actually hand an Excel file to somebody else in the team and say, start adding other the eye of BIM essentially the information of BIM into the model. In a very rapid way and you can edit this okay so we're going to save this building to excel here and we're going to go back to our project and the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to do instead of export i'm going to on the lower right i'm going to do import and the option is to import and update um, space schedules right here import and update space space attributes I'm sorry we're importing and updating space attributes there's a description tab that tells you what each of these is but I'm just going to go and grab that import and update space attributes it says choose the file that you want um, let's see downloads building two there it is I just changed it a few minutes ago or seconds ago it could even change the size of the space so in the Excel file you could say well I don't really want a thousand square foot where am I 1,200? You could say, well, update the size as well. So in the early stages of the bubble, well, you, or, you, or you could say it's 25 by 40 now, and you could say it's 25 by 30. Right. So in the bubble diagramming phase, it actually doesn't matter. You know, geometry, we're still at kind of the bubble diagram. But even now, what we're going, we're working kind of backwards because we want to get this data to be able to generate reports, to be able to do the cost estimates, to be able to color code it by department to show that process that we're meeting the owner requirements. If the owner said we want a 100 bedroom um, condominium here, then we're actually seeing the result of that um, in, in the model. Okay, so let's, let's go back to that department view here. We're still on the second level. So now all of a sudden, all of our spaces actually have a color code. They were random because I wasn't careful at all, but if I go into my 3D view now, it's actually gonna start generating how many square feet of office do we have and color code all the spaces that are offices. So Amy's model that started off with no attributes and then all of a sudden within a few minutes, 
randomly. I've placed the colors in here. So when you click on a space now, and right, you're just showing the second level right now. Yeah, this is just the second level. So if I go and oh darn this thing, it actually I don't know what's going on. It keeps zooming in on me. I got a new mouse and it just likes to zoom in. I haven't figured it out yet. So let's go all floors. There we go. So there are all the floors. And if I turn off the slabs, you'll actually see, start seeing the spaces. There are all the spaces. I haven't changed any of the geometry of the model. I'm just adding attributes. And if I click on this space right here, it says it's a room. I haven't changed the room names, but it's, it's giving me the attribute about that room based on that. And see, so it notice it's got two people in it? Yeah. So if we go to the, let's see, attribute group now, and let's give our department color coding report. It's going to give us a slice of the building per floor, what's on each floor. Um, and if I click on departments, and all of a sudden it starts sorting it by departments, so I could say, well, how many square feet of retail do I have? I have 30,000 square feet of retail based on the classification. How many square feet of office? How many? So all this stuff that's not fun to do in the design process, and that's exactly probably why it's not in the model, because typically in the design process it becomes too cumbersome to deal with all this data. But this data actually informs you on how you're doing on your design work and it actually allows you to communicate to the owner and say we're, we're meeting your original requirements and uh, what your goals were right. as far as uh, use. Right and when we when you get out of, when everybody gets out of school and you start uh, having to deliver these things to owners who are paying you to do these projects those are the kind of things that uh, have always been you know they've they've been the toothaches for architects who have to or you know you have are handing them off to some person who's whose job is to go through and find all this stuff out of the model where here you here you just kind of automate it and make it not a big deal right so yeah you're, you're in, the, in the actual project you're spending a, a majority of the time dealing with all these numbers and square footage and cost and do we have the right adjacencies not on the design itself so our goal with this BIMSTORM process is to show that if you collaborate with others I can send this model off to somebody else now and say to Beck, for example, and say, give us a uniform at level cost estimate of this by taking it into another system and doing that cost estimate. Um, so here is the capacity numbers. We, we defaulted it all at two, but it's showing us that there's two people in each of these spaces. Uh, and you see the name of the space. So there's a lot of other kind of reports that are automatically generated now because we have this level of, um, and then we have the detailed cost estimate. We're leaving it a default value. But you notice that I classified one of the spaces as a high cost item, so all of a sudden it's putting in the line item saying you're spending 131000 on this one space. I haven't done the rest of it, it's all defaulting at, at average. The, mo the rest of the building set at average, but because I classified this at one. So you're coming to a $38 million cost based on the default values that are coming out of the system. So the right, and I, and there were if you if you look at the unit format that Amy had in here mm -hmm. uh, that was coming out of the Revit model, you'll notice that there are the percentages for fees and contingencies and stuff were different. One of the things that needs to happen if you if you want to use these as co comparisons is you really have to go in and, and adjust the defaults so that they match in both places. Right. You know, an estimate can be really far off if you've got a construction contingency of. 5% one place and 15% the other place. Right. And then the last one would be, let's actually look at the um, uh, the building report, which you, we opened up early on. Remember, the first, that was one of the first reports we opened up. And now the difference here is that because we've classified space, this pie chart now is getting updated automatically floor by floor, and it's showing us that we have 17,000 square foot of retail on the fifth floor. Is that a good idea or not? Probably not. We probably want retail down below. Level two, there's bedrooms and whatever. I, I was very random in the way I classified it, but this is a, basically a cross section through the building by use and a pie chart by use based on the classifications that we randomly assigned, including that there's a whole section called none because it wasn't classified. There's 9.3% of the building that's not classified by use. So from an owner's perspective, if I were to analyze um, the scheme that Amy submitted here, I probably would even be doing something like this if I was representing the owner and I got a project in from Revit, I would decompose it. But the ideal scenario would be if the owner sets the requirements, even in an Excel file, hands it to the design team. The design team then takes off in the process that we showed here and we're able to do a, 
uh, commun communicate with the owner at the same level of what you're getting everything you asked us for. We're recommending going from a four-story to a five-story building and still works within the envelope of the planning, uh, the form-based codes that are being used in the city, for example, and it fits with the, the, the views. And now, from a real estate perspective, then the real the, from, uh, the business side, you could say, well, we have this many square feet of one-bedroom units. Yes, if we build this in 2015, in fact, let's do that. that was the last point here. When is this building going to be constructed? Uh, we're going to put a date to it. Um, it's kind of a funny footprint because of this first floor here. I, I would recommend actually, I don't know what what the design intent it was here, but uh, there might be some actual some errors going on on the. It looks like to me like there's. I know that sometimes curves and things from Revit and other models they get interpreted Come differently on. on import. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Now I do. You lost you there for a minute. You, you ended up. It looks like. Oh, it looks like uh, some of the maybe from the Revit import, some of the curves got misinterpreted. We know. I know that we. There's problems typically between import and export between different BIM applications sometimes with curves. So maybe that's what's happening here. I'm not sure. Um, but for example, if I could say, well, that's not really the the first floor. The first floor. This is street level. I don't know if that's really the intent. Maybe you really want to show the second floor as the footprint of the. Um, the building so just... okay come on one one but go back to that now tell everybody what you're what you're looking at right there so they can okay this is the make sure we everybody understands this this is the floor settings you can see the floor to floor heights this actually came in from Revit and you're, you're saying which is the ground floor if you select this it turns that to the ground floor the, the the radio button here so if I say well I really want the second floor to be the ground floor um, or the street level to be the ground or the floor. street level to be the ground floor I'm going to move it to the second floor just for now, just so you can see the difference of what happens. Then it actually resets the building to the, the second level to be the ground floor. Um, so, okay, so let's see what happens here. Um, and let's set the dates now. That was the last thing that we wanted to do. Was there anything else find it that, uh, apart from setting the dates? So now I, I, I set the second level. So now at the site plan level, we're actually seeing the second level as kind of the footprint of the building, which actually looks more representational of what it should look like maybe at a master planning level. You really can decide yeah. uh, what you want to do. Yeah, unless, you, unless, you know, the idea is that some of these spaces are bridging over. Exactly, yeah. Bridging above. So. Yeah. I'm just being random here, just making assumptions, but just to show the point that you can actually push any floor into the master planning view of the model that you're looking at. Uh, down here. Right. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is going to double click on the building. Um, I would even give it a, a real name here because it looks like it's just defaulting to building two. It looks like it's called the courtyard by Amy, maybe. And there you go. And I'll even give it a building number if you want to. And we're going to give it a date. So the, from the real estate and business perspective, we've decided this building makes sense to build, but we're going to project it out that it's going to come in at, uh, we're going to start construction in 2013, November. We'll even give it a specific date, November 12th. You can type these in or you can pull up the calendar and say the construction is going to take from 13 to 14, December 4th, 2014. We're going to project an opening right before Christmas. We'll save that. And now... If you look at this in um, in 3D and in the reports, it actually starts showing up when the construction is going to start. Um, let's see. Actually, it didn't for some reason it didn't register here. Why don't you just export it to Google? Yeah, that's probably better. Google okay, so let's go export. We're doing Google Earth. We'll just go instead of exporting to Excel, we're going to go hit export, export to Google Earth. Uh, export uh, the building the volume so and time-based time code, yeah. and there's actually an include 4D. 4D is time. Well, actually, you could do you could do departments yeah. and do it that actually, way. We too, changed. Yeah. We added this. This is a new feature just from a few days ago. So include 4D actually puts it to 4D timeline. Include date clock, and we could even uh, explode the view so we can actually see how the floors are set up, and we'll include a white background. You'll see what that means. So I export this out. It saves this building, it creates a Google Earth file and saves it on my desktop or in my downloads folder. And then when you launch into Google Earth, then it'll actually show the result in Google Earth. Okay, so Amy's design now that's been worked on and analyzed is going to open up in Google Earth. Yeah, there we go. 
Yeah, this is, you know, and, you know, I'm hoping that it all works and everything pops up here because this is a really good way to do a, a very quick 4D um, pre representation that really very quickly shows an owner what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so there we go. It's not as it's not as fine grained as you can get to with Navis and stuff, but it actually it actually does uh, it kind of um, spreads things across the construction period you select, and um, okay. and as it becomes a pretty pretty good quick representation. Now, it it would look more like a regular building if Kamon hadn't exploded the floors, but uh, I could turn that off. That was just to show what was going on here. So okay, so let's look at what was yeah. exported here. There's two ex two exports. There's a timeline. As you click the timeline, it actually shows you 2014, the construction sequence. These are the exploded floors up above, so you can actually see spaces that actually have attributes associated with them. Uh, as you click on the space, it actually has the two people that we assigned, remember? It's actually there, color-coded by department. On the left side, you can actually decide to ex turn off the exploded view and just turn on the, 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 yeah. the main view. Yeah, come on. I know one... one um... There is a one that some of the um, at least one of the interior design faculty is in the room, and um, it should probably be interested to know, see that you could actually even uh, you could actually have added furniture, and you could actually be tra tracking furniture count at this point too. Right. Well, I, yeah, I don't know if we have time to do that, but yeah, no, we probably don't we do at that. this point. But yeah. I, you know, there's the way to add furniture. So we kept it kind of to the master planning level here. There was one last thing that we wanted to show. What was it? forgot now. We might have to do it this afternoon, but there was one more thing we wanted to yeah. show here. I think that's uh, unless... Um, yeah, I think that's... Uh, you, Tammy, are you there? Um, I don't know. If, if Tammy uh, wants to come on and sort of wrap it up, um, we could do that, or Lee, if she's available, but... Um, well, I could show you know, one, one thing before we leave. Okay. Uh, one, one more thing, Tammy. Let me show one more thing here. Sorry. Uh, we actually took the... Uh, oh, actually, I turned on all the... Uh, this is a network link pulling in this, the other students' work that's coming in fr that's been posted already. So in addition to the building we're just looking at from Amy over here in the corner, this is the other part of the city that's being planned. It's a network link. It's going and grabbing that. But I wanted to show one thing here. Oh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Yeah. Uh, this afternoon, we'll show more of the projects. But we noticed there's a couple more projects coming in, including this one from Ryan. Uh, Ryan submitted a project. Uh, he also posted uh, images. Uh, so this is in the Onema system. He took his, looks like it looks like he, he took the Revit model that he's been working on, I believe. Even the Revit model is posted. These are some of his images that were just coming in just uh, recently. So we're seeing some pretty nice results uh, going to the detail design. And the comments on Ryan's project are almost similar to what we just showed with Amy's. Uh, this looks great as a final kind of result, but it would be nice to see, to decompose it and see what's really going on and to be able to do the analysis on the model from an owner's or other perspective, cost estimating perspectives. Um, I guess, oh, that was the thing I wanted to show, the, the unit format. In the, in the settings, we showed the rough level of cost estimate, but you can actually go to the building settings. And the unit format cost that Amy showed us, you can actually create the same thing manually even here. You could say, well, I want to have a substructure and this and put the numbers in manually here. So that's one way of doing it. This afternoon, I believe Beck is going to be online and will show how they use their tool for unit format cost estimate that can then be sucked into here. So the resulting data in the unit format that Amy had in the Excel file could be brought in and populate a full-blown full blown, um, unit format. Um, um, in fact, I'll go ahead and do a sample one here. There's a sample setting here that you can actually show um, what it would look like if we had the full unit format data in here in the model. This is all kind of a, a starter unit format population here. But OK, so Tammy, you're on. Uh, yes, sorry about that, Kimona. A second, a minute ago, I, we're working here in the room with um, J.E. Dunn, Austin Commercial, Manhattan Construction, and then uh, you mentioned the uh, interior design faculty. Uh, Elizabeth Pober is in the room with us, and um, so I was muted. Apologies for the delay, but uh, we're excited. Everyone's ready to get started going, continue going on the project, so you probably hear a lot of uh, background conversations going on. That's good. Um, 
Yeah, and so I uh, just want to uh, thank you for the kickoff here, um, and uh, we'll talk again this afternoon at the update. Hey, Tammy, before you get off, though, um, I think Kamon put out a lot of, I mean, I think it's it should be pretty clear some of the issues about you know, getting data into the model so they can actually be analyzed and evaluated and all that. Is there anything that you can think of that anything else that anybody's expressed interest in or can think of that ought to be tapped beyond what Kamon's already hit? Is that enough? Get them started? Oh, I, yeah, I think so. And I think that, um, you know, I'll, we'll look at some, some more uh, projects this afternoon where I know the... Um, the data is being uploaded and things like that. Um, we do have, you know, a couple of um, uh, teams that are really interested in the uh, demo perspective and some of those costs and things. So they're looking at it from that approach as well as the construction <laughs> approach. So uh -huh. we'll have some some interesting alternatives. Great. Okay. Good. Actually, uh, okay. since we have Jay Dunn, Manhattan, and Austin uh, participating today, what would really be interesting is to see from their perspective what what's what are some of the drivers like cost or construct constructability, cost as cost related issues, marketing perspective of what what's the market really happening or what's projected to happen in Oklahoma City if this quarter shore gets built up. Uh, how much, how many units can be absorbed in the market, for example. I'm just making stuff up here, but if we know some of those metrics and we can attach them to the models and we could say, here are our assumptions that we can absorb a thousand units of housing over the next three years, um, and here's how much the market value would be of that or the, the rental cost or whatever, that type of analysis, even if it's in their other programs or even if it's sketched on a napkin, kind of getting those assumptions attached to the model uh, and being able to communicate that with the teams would be really interesting. Uh, and it would be great if we can see some of that this afternoon, even if it's, you know, a napkin sketch, like I said, but, uh, yeah. Right, and one of, just following up on that, if, if, the, if the teams have issues like Kamon's talking about and uh, want to talk about um, creating custom attributes to be able to, to do the kind of stuff Kamon's talking about, we can... We can look at we can hold some mini sessions just about doing that while you know while we're setting here. Right. I mean, it'd be easy. It's it's relatively easy to create. Well, actually, it's pretty easy to create custom attributes that would say, you know, these spaces need to be, you know, need to be one level of construction or types or whatever. We but we can do that. We can show. I'll, I'll be around and can show people how they how they can do that if they're interested. Okay, well, Great. you know which room we're in, so we'll be uh, maybe continue working on that and um, talk to you guys in a couple hours. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Kamon. We'll be back on in a couple hours at 2.45. Thanks. Bye. Great. Okay, thanks. Bye.